Before I wanted to be a writer, I actually wanted to be an architect. From sixth grade up until March of my senior year in high school, this was my dream, to be an architect. It probably started long before, maybe preschool or kindergarten, whenever it was that I discovered Legos. As a child, I would spend a good portion of a day not just building houses and high-rises, but entire neighborhoods and cities. I kept hundreds, maybe thousands of them, in a huge cardboard box that I dragged from room to room. As I gradually inched my way toward adolescence, I became less and less interested in toys. I knew it would soon be time to move on to take my engineering experience and expertise to the seventh grade. There was one TV show I always watched after walking home from school. It was the story of a man named Brady. And Michael Brady was pretty cool as far as TV dads go. He drove a long blue Impala convertible. They didn't sell those in Northeast Missouri. He lived in a modern split-level home, and they didn't build those in Northeast Missouri. And he was married to a lovely lady who was bringing up three very lovely girls while he was busy with three boys of his own. He had the perfect life, and he was an architect. The Brady Bunch scenes with him sketching houses and reading blueprints, well, they mesmerized me. This man was getting paid a lot, it seemed, based on the house he lived in and the car he drove, just to be creative. I remember thinking to myself, I want that job. In high school, my fascination turned to inclination. I learned more about architecture, the art and science of planning and designing buildings. They didn't offer drafting engineering courses at Canton High School, so twice each week I drove 80 miles over creeks and past cornfields to take a night, cart, night course on architectural rendering. I devoured books on the subject, visited museums in Chicago and art galleries in Kansas City, and searched for colleges that featured the best programs. Kansas State University, my father's alma mater, boasted one of the nation's most prominent schools of architecture. We visited campus and talked with professors in each of the three summers between my freshman and senior years of high school. I eventually applied and was accepted. In fact, I'd already paid the dorm room deposit when Mrs. McBride, my high school counselor, stopped me in the hall one day. I was wearing my purple K-State School of Architecture t-shirt. Oh, Chris, she said, standing outside her office. And she touched my arm the way people who really care about you do, partly to slow me down, partly to say, this is important. I've been meaning to ask you something about college. I stopped to hear what she had to say. I loved Mrs. McBride, still do. She was one of those people who looked at, spoke with, and worked for every child. And somehow she knew what made each of us tick. She knew what made us happy and sad, confident, and insecure. She knew when to press and when to back off, and she always gave good advice. I've been meaning to tell you, she said, to make sure that you realized how difficult mathematics would be in architecture school. I shrugged it off. No problem. I got this. Mrs. McBride smiled and gently squeezed my arm. Okay, just making sure. And she let go. And I walked away and I never went to Kansas State University. <laughs> Mrs. McBride wasn't trying to dissuade me from architecture school. I'm sure she thought I'd do just fine, but she also thought that I would need to step it up because college is a lot harder than high school. That's all she meant. Take it seriously, Chris, and you'll do just fine. What I heard was this. You better rethink this, Chris. You might fail. That casual comment in the hallway of Canton High School changed the course of my life and I'm so glad that it did. I eventually did become an architect, just not the Michael Brady kind. 30 years later, instead of designing buildings, I design opportunities. Instead of planning a city, I plan a community. Instead of building something that will last a century, I build someone that will last forever. Teachers are the architects of lives. In conjunction with parents like the draftsman with his client, we plan and discuss, design and revise the education of children. 
We create the blueprints, tweaking them as needed to address the functions necessary for each student to succeed. Reading, writing, arithmetic, how students should function. And lessons, assessments, and engagement, how teachers should function. This functionality, how efficient and effective we can be, is paramount to producing graduates who are prepared for the working world. In architecture, they say, form follows function. In other words, you must address purpose and practicality before ever thinking about making something beautiful. But in education, we do both simultaneously. We draw blueprints for learning, function, while modeling compassion for humanity, form. We sketch the path to academic achievement while painting a portrait of honesty and integrity. We enhance brain function while forming the heart. We are architects of lives. And there are many here tonight, educational architects, that is. Two of them were involved in my early construction phase. Two high school teachers with two entirely different teaching styles who influenced my eventual career choice, Mrs. Mary Ellen Clark and Mr. Bill Berry. Although their personalities were quite different, they were identical in how they approached and loved students. Both held high standards, slightly higher than each of us held for ourselves, but not too high for us to achieve with practice, patience, and perseverance. Both knew when it was appropriate to laugh, when it was necessary to discipline, and when it was time to work our tails off. We worked harder for these two teachers than we did all of the other teachers combined because we didn't want to disappoint them and we didn't want to disappoint ourselves. To this day, I tear up thinking about the impact they made on me, the impact they made on thousands of children in our small town and the surrounding communities. Thank you, Mrs. Clark and Mr. Berry. Aside from my parents, no two people have made a more significant impact on me throughout my adolescence than you have. You not only fostered my love of math and music, you fostered my appreciation for integrity, discipline, and forgiveness. Every day I try to be the teacher you are to me. My experience in the Canton R5 school district, not just with Mrs. Clark and Mr. Berry, but with all of my teachers and classmates back home, was truly a blessing. I may teach in one of the state's largest suburban school districts, but make no mistake about it, I'm a proud product of a small town Missouri education. I was surrounded by people who designed my values and ethics and cemented them with empathy and respect. Our corporate partners, Boeing and Monsanto, understand these qualities as well, showing their support by continual investments in public schools and teachers. Amid an environment where it has become vogue to criticize public schools and bash their teachers, Boeing and Monsanto have remained positive and proactive, offering their experience, expertise, and assets. Thank you so much for your long-standing commitment to all children. And to Dr. Chris Nicastro, thank you for showing your dedication to Missouri by giving 38 years of education as a teacher, superintendent, and for the last five years as commissioner for Missouri's Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Congratulations and best of luck in your future endeavors. <laughs> On behalf of all Missouri public school teachers, I would also like to extend a sincere thanks to all DESE leadership and staff and to the citizens serving on our State Board of Education. When a building is complete, all gussied up with stone, glass, and custom woodwork. No one sees, and few appreciate, the internal structural framework. We appreciate your blueprints. I offer thanks to our state legislators for your support as well. And on a personal note, I thank you for voting to restore funding for the Missouri Scholars Academy. I was fortunate to join the faculty of MSA this year, and I assure you, this is one of the most efficient, impactful, and important programs in the development of Missouri's gifted youth and our future leaders. Our reception this evening 
This evening was made possible by the American Federation of Teachers, Missouri National Education Association, and Missouri State Teachers Association. Every day, these organizations provide tireless support and service for the dignity, preservation, and promotion of the teaching profession. Thank you for showing exceptional leadership and remarkable resolve during a trying time for public school teachers. And finally, to our six finalists, Jeremy, Carissa, Lauren, Callie, Laura, and Valerie, who adorn our profession with the skill of a master craftsman. Your words are insightful and inspirational, and it is obvious why you are all here tonight. May you continue to lead our profession to plan and design, create and refine the minds and hearts of everyone that you meet. Please give one more round of applause to this select group of Missouri's finest teachers. Someday, once I'm retired from teaching high school, I hope to teach education classes at the university level to ins inspire aspiring teachers, hopefully providing them with introspection and elucidation on what matters most about this job. And one of the things that matters most, one of the things I never fully realized until just a few years ago, is the importance of a great principal, a principal like Dennis Newell. Hey, Dennis. When I speak to my college students about what outstanding school leadership looks like, I'll speak of you, Dennis. You create and maintain an environment of high expectations and balance that with sincere sport and genuine compassion. I love learning from you, laughing with you, and most of all, working alongside you. Thank you. And the same can be said of my colleagues who have joined me this evening, my fellow architects. I don't think you will ever know just how much it means to me that you're here tonight. Each of you, in your own unique way, has enriched my life, and I treasure that, for showing me the potential of collaboration, the excitement of camaraderie, and your own version of compelling conversation. <laughs> Most of all, I am grateful to you for showing me what true friendship really looks like. Sometimes, I think young teachers mistake my age for wisdom. Of course, the folks that I just mentioned are now chuckling, gagging, and rolling their eyes at the thought of including Holmes and Wise in the same sentence. But there are a few things that I actually do know, a few very important things about teaching that would legitimately qualify as wisdom. And I share them with young teachers whenever that window of opportunity opens, beginning with this. Surround yourself with great teachers. One of the best decisions I've ever made as a teacher and as a person was reaching out to Dave Daniels, Jody Moeller, Doug Jamison, Joe Coachbeck, and Denise Inman, especially Denise, with whom I've been co-teaching for the past five years. I am so much more effective having taught alongside you. None of this, none of this would be happening without you. Thank you. Thank you to my entire Hazelwood family, our superintendent, Dr. Grayling Tobias and his staff, and our Board of Education president, Ms. Desiree Whitlock and her fellow board members, four of whom are here tonight to share this moment with me. Dr. Brenda Youngblood, Mr. Mark Bellman, and Mr. Chuck Woods. Is that my sign? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, it can sound so cliche, so trite, when teachers say, I teach to make a difference in people's lives. But however it may sound to people who just don't get it, it's the truth. We teach to make a difference, intellectually, socially, and emotionally. For a teacher, Making a difference in the life of a child is like an architect designing something avant-garde, a one-of-a-kind structure. Architects crave these opportunities for creativity. 
If you're an architect, if you're in the business of designing something utterly unique, then you go to a city where that kind of opportunity is most abundant. If you're a teacher, if you're in the business of making a difference, then you go where that opportunity is most abundant, public education, where students need us more than ever. Students like Jason, who hates school because the other kids seem so much smarter. Tiffany, an honor roll student who battles an eating disorder. Sammy, whose parents fight every night and she feels responsible. Rolando, who is terrified his parents will kick him out if he comes out. Takia, who gets in fights because that's what she thinks she does best. Shantae, who thinks she'll never live up to her parents' expectations. Greg, who pretends he hates the world, but really just hates himself. Jenny, who plans to run away because she's pregnant, again. Marcus, who just got accepted into college, the first in his family to do so, but he can't afford to go. Hannah, who doesn't think anyone would miss her if she just disappeared. And Jeremy, who is 19 years old and reads at the third grade level, He'd rather get suspended than have the other kids find out. Other than their names, these were actual students of mine. Real people, real lives. I have a hundred more each year, all with their own stories, their own struggles. We all do. We all have students in desperate need of knowledge, direction, and inspiration. Students who need blueprints. Students who need architects. These children who come to us, they want us to make a difference. They need us to make a difference. Their families need us. There is a contagious smog of mediocrity in this country that is descending upon too many cities, too many communities, too many families. It seeps into homes and infects people with beliefs of good enough. Attitudes of, oh well, I guess, whatever. Mindsets of mediocrity that transcend all other obstacles facing us. When you accept good enough, you essentially give up on what if. When I came back to teaching in 2006, after being out of education the previous 11 years, I returned with a clear understanding of what a blessing it is to teach. That is when I began to learn the biggest difference between architecture and education, that the beauty of teaching children, whether they are 18 months or 18 years, is not form or function. It is forgiveness, or as I like to call it, illogical patience. Illogical patience is the act of being patient beyond logic. And I learned it neither in college nor in the classroom. I learned it from my wife and children. I'd like to introduce them all to you now, beginning with my wife, Anne, who teaches at Central Institute for the Deaf. I will never be half the teacher that Anne is. Aaron, who is 12 and wants to become a writer. Andrew, who is 14 and wants to help the homeless. And Charlie, who is 21 and who made me a grandfather 10 months ago. Well, Charlie saved me from myself. What I'm about to share is personal, especially to Charlie. I told him that I was writing a speech and that I wanted to mention him in it, essentially putting a piece of his private life out there in public for everyone to see and possibly analyze or even judge. I asked him what he thought about this, thinking that we might sit down and have a nice, long father-son discussion about it, something deep, maybe a life-changing moment. Perhaps he might look back and reminisce, oh, Father, remember that time when we talked about? Instead, this was his response. That's cool. <laughs> Throughout Charlie's 21 years, there have been many moments of joy and laughter. But there have also been moments, more moments, in fact, of great sadness, frustration, and anger. Three-hour IEPs and week-long suspensions, police home visits, psychiatric hospital stays, broken doors, windows, walls, lamps, and hearts. 
For the past 10 years, Anne and I have struggled as parents and spouses while fumbling and stumbling along the foggy road of autism. Charlie tested us, our skill as parents, faith in God, trust in each other, and especially patience with ourselves. Our son's version of high-functioning autism led us to limits in so many ways that there were times, I have to admit, that I gave up. When I relinquished hope that Charlie would ever live a productive life, that we would ever have peace in our house, that we would ever be truly happy, the kind of happy that young married couples assume is going to come their way. As I grew increasingly bitter over our predicament, Anne remained positive and persistent. Regardless of what Charlie dished out, or what I dished out for that matter, my wife always forgave and forgot. I initially categorized this as a weakness. Surely there must be a limit, I thought, to how many times one should forgive. For years, I continued to battle both with Charlie over his actions and with Anne over her weakness, with no success. It infuriated me that she continued to provide our son with opportunities for change when he showed so few signs of doing so. Her patience was admirable, but at the same time, it seemed utterly foolish. Then one day, it hit me. After years of watching Anne's illogical patience with Charlie, I realized that her approach was nothing more than what a great teacher would do. When a student disrespects or misbehaves or even flat out explodes, we discipline, of course, but the next day, we should hold no grudge. It's a clean slate, a fresh start. Sometimes students will do their best, make it their mission, in fact, to dig deep under our skin in the hopes of driving us out of the classroom forever. But instead, we forgive without hesitation and without contempt. Even when we need to reprimand a child, I do so with a smile on my face. Not a sarcastic, spiteful grin, but rather a genuine smile that says, you screwed up, but I love you anyway. Kids hate that. <laughs> it also shows them that we're not giving up. Too many of our children, not just in Hazelwood or Missouri, but everywhere, every race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic bracket, too many of them no longer look up. Convinced they are and always will be irrelevant or mediocre at best. They feel people giving up on them, whether family or friends, so they begin giving up on themselves. My son felt this way for years, and I was one of the reasons why. But once I started treating Charlie with the same illogical patience that Anne did, the same illogical patience that great teachers show their students, once I proved to him that no matter what he said or did wasn't going to change how much Dad loved him, we both started to heal. Charlie and I are now close. I'd like to believe very close. And there is indeed peace in our house most of the time. <laughs> and happiness in our hearts, always. And my wife, Anne is wise beyond her years. She showed me how to love, how to teach, and how to teach love. Teachers are indeed architects of lives. We assess each child's needs, and we design and construct and beautify around that. We hold students to high standards, making them better readers, writers, and thinkers. We teach them relevant information and model its application. We redirect poor choices and reinforce wise decisions. But when teachers are at their best, their very best, they do these things with illogical patience, a selfless love that is good for the soul, theirs and ours. I am blessed with the opportunity to teach, grateful to parents for entrusting me with their children, and so thankful to my family and friends for being here tonight, and utterly honored to represent the teachers of Missouri. Thank you so much.